Um, if he's ready, I'm going to go ahead and bring on Matt Wise. There it is. There you are. Awesome. Hey, James well, Matt, Leonard, thanks for having me. Go ahead, James. What are you going to say? I was just going to introduce you, buddy. Um, so, Matt, you're a former Green Beret. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a serial entrepreneur. You're a survivalist, an inventor, a crypto investor, a future astronaut. And you're currently working with a team on the Carbon Capture X Prize competition. Uh, I met you, Matt, at the Mars Society conference uh, a couple years back, and now you're working on the uh, this project you're about to talk about. And uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Hey, fantastic! Well, thanks for having me. First of all, um, let me just uh, share my screen here real quick. So we'll just go through a quick little intro. And this is actually a photograph from when the rover arrived in the new world. A lot of people have never seen this. All right, it's a little joke there. Um, but anyhow, what I want to try to do today is uh, kind of looking through the lens of history. We're going to discuss land rights and we're going to discuss the Mars Land Registry, which is a project um, that I, uh, I started kind of conceiving about two years ago. And, uh, and again, really, it's just, it's, it's comes from the lens of history, but it also has a lot to do with, um, you know, looking at the current state of uh, space exploration. And as humans start moving out beyond the earth, the moon, Mars, et cetera, uh, you're gonna start having uh, the question come up. There's gonna be conflicts and disagreements. And if we have a framework uh, that we can establish ahead of time, then that gives everybody something they can agree on. Um, and obviously, you'll never eliminate all conflict, um, but at least it can give us a framework to work through some of that without some of the major problems that we've seen in the past. Uh, like James said, um, I am a, a crypto investor. Um, actually, for a, a number of years, I've uh, been helping to run an organization called Tier One Crypto. Uh, there's a, a Facebook page, and actually, most of the information is in the private Facebook group. Um, but um, uh, I, we started running that uh, years ago before really most people had any idea what Bitcoin or crypto was. And it was just an education community. It was a crowdsourced education community for uh, cryptocurrency investing. Um, as James mentioned, I'm an uh, inventor. I've uh, been published uh, uh, different designs, uh, including a, uh, a Mars colony design through uh, Mars Society. I am working on an uh, XPRIZE project right now. and. Uh, the uh, lead developer for Clockwork Research and Development. I was also out there at the MDRS like James. Uh, I was not uh, the same crew. I was a uh, crew 220, but I did have the opportunity um, through some of these other projects that I just mentioned, I was able to go out and experience that. And I have to say, walking outside of the habitat at the MDRS is really, you have to pinch yourself and realize you're not actually on Mars because I mean, the imagery there, you really can't distinguish from the imagery that we're getting back from the Perseverance and Curiosity rovers. It's absolutely outstanding. Um, so I've, I've lived all over the world. I lived in Africa for two and a half years. I lived in uh, Europe for some time. Uh, Yaka, I actually lived in Slovenia for a while. I lived in uh, Jelena. It's, he's right. It's absolutely paradise. It is beautiful in Slovenia. Um, so to start out with, um, I want to start out with, uh, you know, start with why. Simon Sinek has a fantastic book. It's called Start With Why. 
And you know, why, why make a land registry? You know, why, why does it matter? And again, like I said, avoiding conflict, having a common framework that people can agree upon, uh, but building it on the blockchain, we're creating one that is decentralized and therefore nobody technically owns it. Therefore, there's no bias. And so whether you and I come from different cultures or different um, spacefaring nations on earth or whatever the case is, we can still agree upon, you know, uh, essentially contracts that are based on this decentralized um, system, which um, it it eliminates, uh, it eliminates us needing to trust each other, essentially. And that's one of the beautiful things about blockchain itself. Um, humans will go to Mars. It's inevitable. Um, there's a lot of people that think this is, you know, just kind of a pipe dream off in the future, and it's really not. It's, um, it's happening right before our eyes. So we'll touch on the, uh, uh, the Mars coin blockchain, or as we've been calling it, the Mars chain ecosystem. Um, so um, uh, Philip did a fantastic job talking about currency and I, I won't even try to cover that. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we've touched on smart contracts as well as resource management. And what you can see is how all of these cross over with each other. The smart contracts involve uh, the, the land registry or research resource management. Smart contracts can also be involved in currency as well as you know, cross-pollination between really everything you see in here. Uh, cargo manifests and tracking, voting, uh, voting on how to manage resources, voting on, you know, any sort of community issues uh, within the colony. That's um, absolutely necessary. And again, I'm going to point this toward Mars, but what we're going to see as we go through this, uh, we're going to look at a great deal of history and we're going to look at examples from exploration. But what I'd like everybody to do as we're going through this is uh, overlay our current situation, our current uh, experience with these examples from history. And I think you'll find a lot of similarities uh, and a lot of guidance going forward. And also, we're going to take a look at Moore's Law. Um, now, um, a guy named Moore, obviously, uh, he observed, uh, and he's uh, one of the original founders of Intel, one of the original, um, I guess, perpetuators of the modern uh, personal computer systems. He observed that the number of transistors in a circuit would double about every two years, while the cost was uh, proportionally decreasing. And, uh, and this was not something he made up. This was just an observation that he saw. Now, here's a fantastic chart to show over the last 120 years how accurate that's been. And if you look in the bottom corner, Ray Kurzweil is a futurist whose his predictions have been accurate uh, around 85% over the last 30 years. So check him out, go, go look him up on, the, on uh, Google or whatever. Ray Kurzweil is absolutely brilliant and his predictions for the future, um, again, aside from being highly accurate are incredibly interesting. So if we're gonna overlay transistors onto other technologies, we find that Moore's law also holds true in a lot of situations. So this chart here shows the, uh, the payload cost to orbit as well as the, uh, the current operational satellites. Now, this is just an example, uh, but we can see, you know, just versus the previous uh, NASA uh, cost to launch astronauts versus what SpaceX is able to do in a very short amount of time to bring that cost down. And you can see that the likelihood of us and millions more humans going to space within, well within our lifetime is more than a possibility. So let's take a look at some examples from history. Mark Twain says that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And uh, I think we'll find that it does rhyme faster and faster as we apply Moore's law. Now this map, uh, this is early satellite imagery of the earth. Uh, here's a little bit better image. Uh, as you can see, the earth has changed a lot since uh, the late 1400s. Uh, these are some maps that uh, are actually from the late 1400s. It's believed that these maps are some of the ones that Christopher Columbus was looking at uh, as he set off for his, uh, his goal to cross the Atlantic and uh, ideally go to China, which uh, interesting fact, even at his death, he still believed that he had discovered a route to China. He didn't actually accept that he had discovered a, or found a way to a new continent. Uh, so anyhow, um, he pitched, uh, so in the 15th century, there was an absolute revolution. The printing press had come on, 
the distribution of human knowledge, um, uh, religion, government, exploration was the fad at this time. And you didn't explore without the, uh, without the uh, stamp of approval or without the commission of some sort of royal monarch. It, it just didn't happen. And so he had gone to a number of different kings and queens throughout, the, throughout Europe, trying to get people to back him. And, uh, and nobody would. And finally, after several pitches over several years, Queen Isabella of Spain, uh, who you saw in those previous pictures, uh, she finally uh, commissioned him. She said, okay, we'll back you. I feel inspired by what you're doing. You're kind of crazy, but you're going to do this. And you have to realize that um, one of the top, uh, I guess, uh, social de demographics was the merchant class in that day. And the merchant class was very aligned with or allied with the monarch class. And, uh, and again, not so, not so dissimilar from today where we have um, you know, large corporations that are allied with governments and um, each kind of serving their own interest in certain ways. Um, so anyhow, he sailed um, approximately a month after he set off, he landed in what would be known as North and South America. And, um, and then from there, and so this is 1492. Okay, so now fast forward about uh, 100 years and this character, who is a complete wild card, um, in fact, Queen Elizabeth trusted him so little that she wouldn't actually let him go to the Americas. Instead, he managed an expedition where he sent somebody else to go. Um, he had inherited essentially the southern half of the east coast of the modern United States. Uh, and there's a whole long story with that that I won't get into. His half brother got the north half. And so for somebody just to say, here you go, here's this massive amount of land is, is completely ridiculous in, in, a, in, in a modern, uh, in a modern uh, view. But anyhow, Sir Walter Raleigh here uh, was the first person to establish any sort of colony. And this was in 1585. So less than 100 years after Columbus landing, we've got a colony. And so if you consider that with Moore's law and overlay how quickly we could potentially be going to Mars, uh, I mean, Elon intends to send his first um, unmanned craft within the next couple of years uh, and then apply Moore's law. I think it'd be much, much quicker, a fraction of 100 years before there's actually humans living there. Um, and then fast forward again. Um, now, Walter Raleigh was knighted and then he, uh, he sent several other expeditions to try to establish uh, you know, more of a foothold there. Uh, of course, we know that that first colony he established is Roanoke, and uh, that was, um, no one really knows what happened to that colony. It's called the Lost Colony, uh, but um, interesting history about that. So um, going forward, Jamestown. Uh, now, in 1606, uh, English colony set sail with a charter from the London Company, and a company was a bit different than what we see today as a modern company. And uh, again, we won't dig into the details on that, uh, it was more like a, a small government, if you want to think about it. The, um, the colonists uh, set out to establish uh, what would later be Jamestown, which was the first permanent colony in the Americas. Now, this is 1607. So again, we're still barely 100 years after the first landing. And uh, now this colony was established, abandoned, reestablished, burned in, a, in an internal revolt, um, rebuilt, accidentally burned down again. Somebody accidentally set fire to their colony. And, uh, and then it was eventually moved to modern day Williamsburg where it uh, essentially exists to this day. By, uh, by 1608, Polish and German craftsmen uh, were producing glassware. So from, from 1585, that first colony to approximately a um, you know, short time later, you have crafts, craftsmen sending the first exports back to Europe. Uh, and so again, overlay that on people potentially going to Mars and you could see the first Martian exports coming back to Earth uh, much, much quicker. Um, so let's see, initially, now this fun fact, initially only men of English origin were permitted to vote. Now here's where we go back to the voting systems that we discussed and Leonard touched on with a blockchain system. Um, if you have a, a trustless decentralized blockchain system, the ability to vote is not dependent on who you are, where you're from, any of those other things. It's, it's completely, it, there's complete equality there within the colony. This is something that they had not established uh, when they were colonizing the Americas first. So, um, 
and that would actually led to the first um, to the first strike in the uh, in the new world where they said they refused to work unless they got the right to vote. Uh, moving on, um, there was a, so a few years later, uh, Governor Sir Thomas Dale assigned three acre plots uh, as 12 about 12,000 square meter plots to the first sell settlers and then settlers that came later would get smaller plots, but he did this to boost the economics of the new world and it, it actually worked very, very well. And there's a, a great many arguments that say that um, this is why it's necessary for people to be able to claim land on Mars um, is purely that it will bring uh, greater economic growth and it will um, inspire more people to move to Mars. It will actually um, perpetuate greater growth on the red planet. Um, a lot of times, so uh, moving forward, uh, let's see, here's a uh, drone footage of Jamestown, the original colony. Doesn't look that dissimilar from uh, from this aerial uh, from this aerial artist rendition of the uh, of the SpaceX uh, Mars colony, does it? All right. So the next thing we want to discuss, um, actually, before we move on too quickly, it's fun to note that less than 300 years after the first footsteps on the New World, there were more than two million people living in the New World. And so again, if you apply Moore's law and you apply our, our modern day situation, 2 million people living on Mars could very, very reasonably happen within our lifetime. And so again, that makes the idea of land rights and currency and voting and some of these other things, but especially land rights, much more prescient. So going into conflicts, um, there's, there's a number of conflicts purely over land rights and borders. Um, the Anglo-Dutch Wars in 1652, French Indian Wars, Queen Anne's War. This was a war for the control of an entire continent. Um, you know, imagine if we saw a conflict for the control of an entire planet. Um, there was armed conflict between the, uh, the Hudson Bay Company, which was, it was a company, but it was the de facto government for North, most of North America for approximately 200 years. Um, they managed all trade, they ran all the trade, and uh, the competitors formed the Northwest Company, and then they had an armed conflict. So these were essentially many states, uh, which called themselves companies at the time, and they were having armed conflicts uh, because they wanted uh, rights to certain trade areas and certain uh, resources. Um, and again, there's, there's a list of other smaller conflicts and whatnot um, that happen purely over land rights. Uh, so we're going to discuss uh, historic land rights. Now, essentially, as we've come across it, there are, there are three major uh, historic uh, bases of land rights that we'll discuss. The British idea was that the king owns it all and uh, he bestows upon you the right to live on the land. And that's really a, a state-centric um, ideology. Uh, then you had the French uh, paradigm, which said that um, if you claimed a plot of land and you worked the land, you put some sort of effort into that land, that was what established your claim to it. Um, and then we also look at uh, contrast with the Islamic idea of land rights, which was that um, Allah, God gave you the right to be essentially his caretaker of the land during your lifetime, but the land all belongs to him and nobody else. And so as we move forward um, in the new world, uh, the, the colonists were trying to create laws to govern their communities, to basically create a, a civilized um, system that they could all abide by. Edmund Burke was quoted as saying, weak government under the Articles of Confederation, and this was what they called these laws that the Virginia territory was creating, um, takes away the incitements to industry by rendering property insecure and unprotected. And what I think this uh, alludes to is the importance of establishing very solid um, land rights and the ability to claim land and having those rights protected under a certain agreed upon system. If we take a blockchain system that is an immutable ledger that uh, cannot be hacked, cannot be uh, fabricated, and then we have something that everybody agrees upon because it's a trustless system, then uh, I think you see the protection of those rights of of that land, now, whatever that land you wanna do, whether you wanna put a dome on it and build a potato farm, or if you simply want to mine for water ice and create some sort of industry there. 
Also, we had the head right system in the new world. Um, and again, this was, this was also very state centric. Uh, one to a thousand acres of land were granted to those willing to cross the Atlantic. Um, now, what happened a lot of time, and most of the time, in fact, there were a lot of nobility that were excited by the adventure of the New World, and so they would go to claim land. But then there were a lot of others that were simply excited by potential profits of owning land, and so they would send indentured servants. They would send slaves, and uh, those, those slaves would be responsible for working for a certain number of years on this person's land. What ended up happening, though, is when you finished your servitude, you were kicked out and all the land, you know, near, near the coast, near the, uh, near the towns, this was already owned by these, these uh, mostly, uh, mostly nobility, but not entirely. And so this would push the, uh, these newly freed indentured servants much further west to kind of live out um, in, a, in more undeveloped areas and they would have to fend for themselves. And this led to a great deal of tension uh, because of that inequality between the laborers and the landowners. Okay, so next we're going to look at um, modern uh, space claims and treaties. <clears throat> now, so one thing I want to discuss real quickly before we get into the, uh, the actual project that I'm working on, which I know everybody's super excited to hear, I'm excited to talk about it, but the more I research this, there is, there's so much information to understand to know why this is important, and why it's more than just a digital game that we're playing. So we've got um, a number of people who have made claims. Uh, Aideen Lindsay in 1936 uh, made claims to the entire solar system, uh, the moon, the Mars, every, all the stars. And uh, people even offered them money to buy land from him on the moon and Mars and, and, and certain celestial bodies. But the thing is, his claim was based on notarization from a Earth government, specifically the United States. Uh, this man, Dennis Hope, uh, since 1980, Dennis Hope has been selling land on the moon. He filed a claim, filed a copyright, and according to him, he owns the moon. And according to approximately uh, 2 million people, uh, which he says also includes celebrities and U.S. presidents, but that's un unconfirmed, uh, he has sold over 2 million acres of the, land, of the moon to people. And, and I, I believe most people are looking at this as a novelty, uh, but Dennis Hope truly believes that he owns and is selling the moon and that he has a right to it. But again, his copyrights are based in earth governments. Now, this is, a, this is actually another hilarious story. Gregory Nemitz claimed ownership of asteroid 433 Eros uh, which um, near Shoemaker landed in 2001. And his company, Orbital Development, issued NASA an invoice of $20 for parking the spacecraft on the asteroid. So he issued NASA a parking ticket, which NASA has so far uh, declined to pay. <clears throat> and, uh, and I won't go into it, but I, I have a page of people who have uh, made claims over the years, over the last century or so, and uh, is, is really fascinating to read. And then we get into the Outer Space Treaty. Now this is uh, much, this is a hotly debated issue. And from what I've been told, the majority of legal experts are reluctant to even go into land claims because it is so hotly debated. And despite what some people will say, it's extremely vague. And in some places it's even, um, uh, in a way it almost uh, contradictive uh, within the Outer Space Treaty and the Artemis Accords. Um, so essentially, and here, this is actually the signing of the Outer Space Treaty in 1967. Now realize that the Outer Space Treaty has not been updated since 1967. So prior to much of our, um, you know, our moon landings and work in space, uh, we, we have this treaty which has not been updated. So Article Three says that um, essentially that um, the it'll be the um, everything in space will be in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, Article Five states that um, the treaty shall regard astronauts as envoys of all mankind in outer space, and then Article Six says that. Any agency, any organization, whether it's international or private or whatever, 
is owned by the government from which they come. And so essentially you can't go to space unless you are owned uh, by a certain government and that government is responsible for you, uh, which uh, speaking to James' conversation earlier, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how you can essentially apply laws to somebody if they're creating a private uh, separate colony uh, on, a, on the moon or Mars or any other body. So that's, a, that's another hotly debated subject. Again, people are gonna go and people are gonna build settlements and eventually there's going to be a need for land claims. So regardless of what the current laws and treaties are, there will absolutely have to be something in place because people will begin claiming land. It's not, it's really, regardless of what we would like it to be or what the current laws say, these are things that I believe will happen. And if we don't prepare for it ahead of time, uh, we're going to be doing damage control. And then we also have the Artemis Accords, uh, which interestingly enough, the Artemis Accords have not been signed by China or Russia who recently signed a partnership to develop the moon. Uh, and so I can't really see them uh, really complying with any ag agreements or laws or treaties that we've made under the Artemis Accords uh, or even really under the um, Outer Space Treaty uh, when the rest of the world says, well, hey, you can't do that. And they say, okay, well, come and stop us. Solutions for the future. Now, this is a part that I am, I'm so excited to tell everybody about. And this is actually the first time we've uh, exposed this to the public. Uh, and again, we're going to go back to the Mars chain, chain ecosystem here, uh, just to touch on this, this slide once more. And uh, then we get into the Mars Land Registry. Now, this is a blockchain-based app for registering claims, land claims on Mars. A couple of screenshots of what the app uh, will look like when it's released. Now, this is obviously not out there in the public yet, but this is under development currently. This will allow you to take a look at Mars, um, and this is also going to be connected to massive databases of some of the best imagery and the most current imagery we have. You'll be able to look at some macro views as well as zoom into uh, a more granular view of the Martian surface. And then you can see here, there's um, when you click on a certain one kilometer square, it'll tell you whether that's been claimed already or if you can register a claim. And then there's also, if you look at some of the icons on the uh, right-hand side of this bar down here, uh, you'll see there's a, a icon for any imagery that's there. Uh, there'll be a, a wiki link for any particular, like you see the Viking lander, uh, et cetera. And then um, a little Mars VR. So as we uh, develop the Mars VR system, you'll actually be able to click on that link. And with a VR headset, you'll be able to look around at that particular plot of land based on whatever imagery we have of that. And again, this larger icon that you see here with a, a magnifying glass, uh, this is one of the most exciting features. And this will allow a person to uh, take a look at all the scientific research that's been done in that region or even that specific location, as well as contribute their own research. Uh, very similar to uh, Zooniverse or um, any other, uh, like Wikipedia, any other sort of crowdsourced information source, uh, we intend to crowdsource as much research and investigation muscle so that we can expand human knowledge and human uh, deepen our human understanding of Mars. It's very, very exciting. Uh, there's a lot more details to this. Again, I wish I had time because there, there really is so much interesting things to talk about. Um, I wanted to take a, a quick side note here and talk about somebody Lexan Kaira is one of my personal heroes. Uh, the man um, was born in extreme poverty, so extreme in fact that his family couldn't, have feed, couldn't afford to feed themselves and he was thrown in the river as a baby because they couldn't afford to feed him either. He survived, uh, he grew up, went to a mission school, uh, had to work for an entire harvest season to pay for his education, which by the way was less than a dollar, but he had to work for an entire harvest season just to save up that much money. So Legson walked, uh, now he learned to read, his parents were completely illiterate. He learned to read at the mission school and decided that he wanted to be, become a, a, a higher educated person. He believed that university education is what would uh, give him a, a leg up to a life of meaning. Walked nearly 3,200 miles 
And if you've ever, I lived in Africa for two and a half years, and it is hard to describe how vast Africa is. I hope we have people on this, uh, on this webinar right now who are from Africa. It's absolutely beautiful. I've lived in West, Central, and East Africa. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to live in South Africa. Um, it is just, the land is incredibly vast, and I've never seen any place in the world that is just so big and, and wild. And Legson walked you nearly know, 3,200 miles through it all um, to Cairo in the hopes of attending university. He wrote to a, uh, the dean of a college in the United States, actually uh, only maybe an hour from where I grew up in Seattle, um, to Skagit Valley College. And the dean was so inspired by Legson's dedication and his, uh, his passion that they were able to uh, give him a scholarship. And then Legson, of course, also found a job when he came to the United States so that he could work have his education. Uh, he eventually earned an advanced degree from the University of Washington and retired as a professor in Cambridge after writing four books, uh, being married, having a number of children, seven grandchildren. Um, and so the reason I tell you this story and the reason he inspires me so much is this tells me if, if I can be in the middle of the, the deepest bush in Central Africa, and yet I run into an African guy who has a cell phone and he's got Bitcoin on his cell phone. And this man Legson here was able to go leave his village, go to uh, get an education. Then that tells me that anybody on earth has the opportunity to go and become, go to get an education. If they wanna to go to space, uh, they can get the education of being an uh, aerospace engineer, whatever it is they need, get the next ticket on the next Starship flight out to Mars, and they can claim their own land. And so I believe the equity that this provides us for any human on earth means that not just the, the millionaires and the people with the most access to technology, but the people, any human on earth with the inspiration and the will to go there can claim land and develop Mars. And I'm hoping that this creates the movement and the, the inspiration for more humans to go and do that. So here's another shot, another screenshot here. Um, and again, I said any human, but uh, if you want to guess at the nationality or uh, whoever this is in, in this avatar here, uh, it's Marvin the Martian, by the way. So I think I ran a little bit long there, James. I apologize. Uh, just so much information in this subject. And every time I, I discuss one more thing, it's uh, it leads me down yet another rabbit hole because a land claim is not a, a simple thing, which even I believed when I started this project that, oh, it's simple. We just go there, we make the claim and we put it on a, put it on a ledger. And it's not that simple. It's, there's so many uh, more issues that are interwoven into land claims. I think the most important land claim, and I'll kind of leave you with this, uh, economists and uh, really scholars of, of, all, of, all, um, of all disciplines agree that one of the most important attributes or one of the most yeah, important attributes of human freedom is the right to property. Now, whether that's the simple the belongings that you own or actually possessing land and being allowed to live on it in peace, and that this is one of the most important fundamentals of human freedom. And if we can't take that to Mars with us, then uh, I feel that we're in trouble. Well said, Matt. <clears throat> um, no, thank you so much for that presentation. The historical material you went over is very fascinating, something I'm also interested in, how the North America colonization was begun. There's a lot of parallels, obviously, to, to Mars. Um, so your first question is from Leonard Lopin, actually. What are your thoughts about the enforceability of property rights on Mars? That is actually one of the most common questions I've gotten. Uh, I had a chance to have a fantastic conversation with Michelle Hanlon. She's the, she's the head of the National Space Society. She's also the co-director for the uh, Center for uh, Air and Space Law. So she's one of the foremost experts on this. And, uh, and this was a question that she also had. And it's one that as far as earth legal systems, we haven't really, we don't have a clear answer. Uh, most, most lawyers don't wanna touch it because it is so controversial. Uh, but in my personal opinion, um, I believe that, um, the, the earth, the governments of earth, now let's just take every country on earth, really the only, 
the only authority they have on this subject is whether or not they recognize your claim. But when you're, when you're occupying, when you're living on Mars, I almost said occupy Mars, um, when you're actually living on Mars, it's whether or not the other people you live there with have a system that you've mutually agreed upon for, for who occupies which spaces of land and who's able to use it under what context. And I think if you look at um, the Chinese versus the Russians versus the Europeans versus the Americans uh, with a lot of our current political disagreements and things that we have, we can't rely on, uh, in my opinion, we can't rely on a ledger or an authority under the UN or under an American system or under a Chinese system because there's a level of distrust there uh, between the different countries based on our, our mutual histories with each other. However, if we have an independent ownerless blockchain system, then I think nobody has to worry about if they trust each other because essentially this blockchain system is like an independent third party which we can all trust and we can all agree upon. Okay, great. Uh, not a question, but a comment from Michael Lane, who's one of our upcoming speakers today. He says, to verify a land claim, you must have GPS-like precision of place. Mm -hmm. There's infrastructure required. And, and to me, that brings up the idea that, you know, once in your system, you allow someone to claim land, how are some ways that they can hold on to that land? That's actually a great question. And we've, uh, deal, we've I've had a chance to dive into this in, uh, in, in a fairly deep detail. Um, GIS has, or um, yeah, the uh, GIS survey has already created a very detailed um, coordinate map of the surface of Mars. So we do have, uh, for instance, uh, the Mars rovers, um, the, the coordinate data that they have just based on their own current locations, even without GPS satellites, um, is, very, is very specific so far. And, and based on the GIS data that we have applied to Mars, uh, we can be very specific about where the borders of those uh, one square kilometer plots. And it, of course, this is just the standard we're working off of so far, but let's, let's say for instance, a one square kilometer plot, uh, we can say with relative, um, specificity uh, exactly where those borders are at. Now, obviously in the future, um, you know, we're planning on dropping a Starlink constellation around there, which would have GPS capabilities and things like that to give us even more fine uh, GPS data. But uh, that is actually a fantastic question because of course you wanna know exactly where your borders are at. Yeah, and we just got another comment about this topic from Mike Laurie. Uh, he said, GPS position is not mandatory, but it's a nice to have. Before GPS here on Earth, <clears throat> deeds used landmarks and implanted points, which implanted points are those little metal disks you'll occasionally find people have stuck into bedrock in various places. So right, there actually right. are ways to do this. Uh, if, certainly if you have boots on the ground, there's way to, there's way to mark this off, but yeah, to your point, Matt, the U.S. Geological Survey has done a ton of work already to map Mars. Um, there's also several thousand place names that they've uh, they have a database of. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly share uh, a variant of one of the slides you shared. Um, so this is the this is the slide I showed during my talk this morning about our experiment platform and some of the mm -hmm. upcoming infrastructure projects we're going to do. And if you'll notice, I put on here one of the things we're going to do is create a map of Mars uh, with location selection, um, and this this will enable applications like your land registry to be built. Um, this this will be something that we do in partnership with uh, another project I help out with, Marspedia. Marspedia.org is in a free online encyclopedia that the Mars Society works on. And we recently created a Mars Atlas that uses the US Geological Survey data. But we're gonna go one level deeper. We're gonna provide a 3D version, a GIS, a real GIS app that has uh, ways to traverse Mars um, not just a, in a 2D model on a computer screen, but all the way down if you wanted to put a VR headset on and walk around on the surface. There actually is already data available from the 1996 Mars Global Surveyor Mission where we had coverage of altimeter data around the globe. 
and we can overlay that with imagery from the various missions, not just the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, but also all the lander and rover missions as well. So that's something we want to uh, enable in, into the Mars coin blockchain, uh, have that available for applications to be built with. And you know, your land registry would be one of the first class applications for that. Absolutely. And like we talked about earlier, the, this ecosystem really crosses over. And what we're doing is we're creating a fairly slim app for the ability to uh, register land claims, but then using the IPFS and uh, also the Marspedia that you discussed and, and other external resources, um, this, this app will be very, um, it, it'll be very quick and nimble, but you'll be able to access massive amounts of information and overlay that information on whatever plot you're looking at. Um, as well as the ability to contribute some of your own research, uh, which I think is going to just be an absolute fantastic. And there's what's a, what shocked me more than anything was I have not been able to find any sort of app or resource online where I can do this, where I can, you know, really zoom into Mars and find out something specific about it. There's just there's a uh, piecemeal data here and there, and uh, and a lot of it's at a very high scientific level, uh, but I couldn't find an app that really let me take a look at Mars this way. You know, let alone you know, register a land claim. Yeah, there's Google Mars, but it is very shallow. There's not really much you could do with Google Mars. It's it kind really of dated is. now. There's NASA has the Mars Trek app, which again, you kind of, it's focused on their planetary data sets, not really being able to add in data to if you wanted to kind of explore an area. I mean, one of the things I'm really fascinated about is planning out transportation routes for a future human settlement on Mars and in which land is the best for that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to build a hyperloop uh, across part of Mars, like where, what are the best places to do that? So very exciting. Well, thank you so much, Matt. This was great. I uh, really appreciate your talk today and thanks for participating in our event. You bet. And if, uh, if people actually, if, uh, if people can just follow me on uh, social media and uh, actually we'll just bring this up real quick, if you don't mind, sure, James. Go for it. Um, so if uh, people want to follow, uh oh, there it is. Yep. My uh, slide stopped functioning for a second. So uh, we do have um, uh, a Reddit as well as a uh, Facebook page and Twitter. And if anybody just wants to follow me or the Marsland registry, there's really so much more information, but a 30 minute talk to give background as well as the information is really not enough time. So I'm sure I'm super excited to answer more questions. Um, Eva, I saw your question in the chat earlier. Unfortunately, we don't, uh, we have to move on to the next speaker and, and we will answer that one in, in the chat. Uh, but um, yeah, please follow us on social media. Uh, this is going to be really exciting as we release it. Uh, we're hoping to release this late this year. It's going to be very exciting. And uh, it's going to be a lot more surprises than we've even had a chance to talk about in this presentation. So with that, James, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt. Awesome.